with you. So first, uh, Andrea Bertolini, who is the robo-law guy, um, an expert in robotics and, and the law um, at the Scuola Superiore Santa Anna, Santa Anna in Italy. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, this really connects with much of what we uh, said and what we heard before even the last question. I do firmly believe that we need to train uh, new kinds of uh, intellectuals, new kinds of students, and train new kinds of skills in all fields of knowledge. For instance, I myself am starting a summer school uh, that probably will turn into a larger pro uh, program soon to train lawyers to deal with the issues of robotics because this entails understanding a bit of the engineering behind it, being able to talk with economists and being able to think of the law in somewhat a slightly different way from, um, from what we uh, did until now. So um, I think this should uh, happen in all different fields of education. I also speak with engineers and if the European Union is moving on very clear directions of the so-called X by design, so for instance privacy by design, um, this will be true also for uh, engineers that will have to be able to cooperate and work with lawyers at a very early stage basically already when they are developing their products so to make sure that their products are compliant with the new, com new and emerging regulations. So uh, we need different kinds of skills and we need to train different kinds of uh, uh, students in different and elaborate in different kinds of uh, programs. But uh, this, is, this is a very relevant issue. Thank you. David Bissett for, from um, EU Robotics. Okay. Um, there are, there are two issues I want to, to concentrate on. The first is, we talk a lot about STEM subjects, and it's clear that we do need to generate a lot more engineers. There's an enormous shortage of engineers right across the world. But one of the things that will happen with robotics is uh, actually a need for more creatives. Um, so there will be an outlet, simply because robots, particularly in manufacturing, in small businesses, will have the opportunity to make things in a very much more bespoke way, almost going back towards a craft type industry, but driven through robotics. And that will require people to have those design and craft skills. And, and also the point that's just been made about doing things by design. Uh, design is crucial and critical, both in terms of interaction, but also in terms of building in safety, building in ethics, building in uh, the, the right interfaces for the people who are going to use them. We will have that opportunity. And we, so we need not just the STEM skills, but also creative skills as well. And the second point I want to make is about the life choices that we make. The current education system across the world is geared to training people into doing one particular thing, and by the age of about 18 or 19 or 20, they have been fixed into a particular path of career. And it's very hard for them to get a second set of education later in their life. Now, with the advance of technology, um, we're going to find more and more that people who are trained up in a particular skill in the first part of their life will find that by their midlife, that skill is no longer required and they need to be retrained. They need to find a new type of work to do. And we must change the system so that that second education becomes as a right and becomes as an, it's, it will become a necessity, but it comes as a right to all of our citizens. And that, that's a, a, a sea change in the way that we currently deliver education that needs to take place. Uh, Fiorella Aporto, who's uh, from the School of Robotics in Genoa. Thank you. Um, there are epochs in which uh, people is learning more from outside than in school, uh, because there are uh, era in which the uh, technology is really changing the way in which life has been done. It was so like in uh, Florentine Renaissance, when the school was too old to face the challenge of the, uh, of the society at that time. Now our kids are learning innovation and technology with smartphone, IOTs, etc. But this is too superficial. You know, they, they, they like to, to play with these objects. But then what about you know, the law of physics, of mathematics, etc.? That's its a big, big concern by teachers and parents, you know, they play too much, but then they throw away the, the, the last release of the, of the, uh, the smartphone because it's too old. We use educational robotics to 
teach the laws of physics and mathematics. Because with robots, you have to cope with a machine that feedbacks you on what you have learned. And we have hundreds of kids saying, Professor, now I understand why should I learn mathematics. Thank you, Vera. Um, Nikos Pronios from Innovate UK. Uh, I will continue a little bit on the education and then I will catch up on the ethics. Yes, please. Um, well, one example that I have in my close to what was mentioned by Fiorella is um, the, an accident that happened some years ago, uh, Air France accident in airplanes. Um, it was a very advanced airplane, fully automated, many sensors, a lot of software, a lot of you know, logic in there. And uh, a main reason of, uh, that this accident happened with all the people lo were, were lost was because the pilots were start, had started to lose their basic flying skills. That was, goes back to the basic fundamentals of the laws as opposed to simply playing or toying around or goofing around with various devices that we now have. So this is definitely a fear that I have for my kids because uh, not understanding what is below the, the, the underlying principles and laws and simply playing around as a black box as if something magic happens uh, I'm not particularly fond of it. Now, on the issues of ethics, um, I, I, will, I typically I will have to divide the period, two periods. One is the short term, the period that we have right now, and the, one, the other is the longer term. In short term, I am uh, probably the minority that I am avoiding to use the term autonomous. Probably because of my Greek origin, the autonomous means from autonomous, meaning the ones who create its own laws. And most of the systems that we have right now are not like that. They are systems very well designed that they can operate for specific environments to do specific things, but they are doing only what the designer or the programmer or the algorithmic, the, you know, the, the, the guy who designed the algorithm has programmed them to do. They are, can be very helpful and they can do a lot of things that we discussed earlier, but they are still automated not automated or adaptive. I distinguish the term of autonomous for the longer term, which is the artificial intelligence that we see if we go to another level of artificial intelligence and not, not having specificity but being more general about it. And uh, in the first phase that I mentioned, uh, the laws, the ethics are basically with the operator or the guy who puts the logic into the robot. It's similar to the driver that drives the car or something like that. By the way, in the, my for the autonomous car or automated car, I, I would feel better if, I, if when I'm sleepy, for example, and I have to drive back to London, I could hop on, on the driverless car or automated car and can take me there without me, with me sleeping and not worrying about anything. Now, the future term uh, in the things that we have seen in the C-3PO or in the, in the bicentennial man that we have seen in the movies or iRobot, another thing, mm -hmm that when the ethics and the laws of, uh, you know, the basic robotic stuff, if we go back to Asimov, um, are starting to play around, uh, excuse me, uh, this is a complicated issue that it's not easy for me to uh, clarify and uh, comprehend, because probably I'm not used to thinking about that, but it's definitely an issue that we will eventually, we will come up against. Thank you. Alan Winfield from Bristol Robotics Laboratory. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good evening, everyone. <coughs> I'm um, an advocate, a strong advocate for robot ethics. In fact, I also build ethical robots, which is a, a slightly different thing. But uh, uh, so why are robot ethics so important? Um, I would say in one word, trust. The point is that if the fourth industrial revolution, which is what it's now being called, um, is to be successful, uh, it, it will only be, su be successful if our robots and autonomous systems are trusted. Now, um, ethics are a conversation. They're, they're a conversation about what robots we want in our society, in our lives, and perhaps equally importantly about what robots we do not want in our lives. Uh, robot ethics are also a start of a process toward legislation, and I, I was very glad that uh, Maddie uh, referred earlier to uh, the need for legislative frameworks. 
Uh, but legislative frameworks start with ethics. They start with ethics that move to standards through to legislation. And I just want to finish by telling you that um, I'm, I've been part of um, a British Standards Institute working group on robot ethics for the past four or five years. And I'd invite you to look up on Google uh, BS8611, which is a draft standard. It's the world's first draft standard on robot ethics, which is currently open for uh, public comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I suppose I, I've got two broad questions on those themes. The first is then, does anyone feel that robotics, artificial intelligence, that sort of thing should be on the curriculum somewhere? Um, do we need a baccalaureate that keeps people's options wider as they go through the education system? And secondly, um, often on the ethical side, which I think a lot of people, you know, that's their concern about, about robots. Um, I saw a very interesting case study on, I think, Fiorella's website. Um, and I think it's very instructive sometimes to think with specific examples. And one of the examples given, which sort of made me laugh and then made me think, was should a care bot give an alcoholic drink to an alcoholic? So, um, so could, could the panel just briefly address those initial questions and then we'll open it up to the, to the audience. So uh, very quickly, I'll touch upon both. Uh, uh, do we need different kind of curriculum? I think we need to uh, rethink existing curricula. So for instance, this year I'll be teaching in my law school a course on machine ethics and, and uh, robot ethics to lawyers. Again, because lawyers need to be able to learn and understand these new uh, frameworks and new, uh, these uh, new kind of issues. And you need to do the same thing with engineers. And most of my courses are taught both to engineers and lawyers together, so because I want them to work together. Um, uh, with respect to ethics, very often, I agree, I fully agree, uh, so you're not the only one on the table that uh, uh, autonomy is often misused, and uh, I do not think that uh, existing devices are truly autonomous, and therefore they're not beings, but actually things, and that was the example that we were talking about before uh, in, the, in the previous panel. Um, and I, I, I do believe that in many cases, solving the machine ethics issue is actually solving the ethical issue that lays behind it and then find the technical solutions to make the machine capable of assuming the ethical decision that a human being would have adopted in, that, in those very circumstances. So uh, it's, it's a double problem. It's a, it's a very complicated issue because at times it's very complicated to decide whether the car should strike the uh, innocent old lady on the, on, the, on the sidewalk or run over the young child that has uh, um, uh, uh, cross uh, the road uh, inappropriately. I think trying to answer both questions again. Um, obviously, robots can be used as tools within schools in order to teach, but I think we've got to stick to the fundamentals. Te teaching science and 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 maths is, is key to understanding, to providing a basic understanding. But one of the things that will happen is that um, our children will have to take some really tough decisions uh, when they get older and when we get old about how they use that robotics technology to look after us. Mm -hmm. And I think those ethical concerns, they do need to go back into the curriculum. The curriculum will change and they will need to be included just the same way that we've, uh, the parents of my generation had to deal with Facebook and, and, and the internet intruding, in, intruding uh, in our children's lives. Um, our children will have to deal with robots and how they're going to intrude in, in their lives and, and those things will need education. Thank you. Um, there is a, a document by the European Parliament about that the, um, in uh, 2025 we will lack millions of high skill technology workforce. This is very, very important because by, uh, from now on, you know, um, many uh, skilled workers and professionals will go on retired. How can we um, upgrade the European workforce to cope with the uh, challenges in economy? I tell you, I mean, I'm not fixated, but I tell you, education and robotics is the best way to teach and to promote STEM education. 
in every layer, girls. We have Roberta, European project by Fraunhofer EI, uh, in Bonn. It's a very good project to promote STEM for girls. Ro educational robotics we use for inclusion in autism and uh, uh, delaying, cognitive delaying. And also to, uh, it's the best way if, if you give a robot, you know, to a skilled, skilled worker, it's a way to upgrade because by, through a robot, it can teach, he can learn electronics, programming, mechatronics, and he can use all his past knowledge, you know, to be, you know, to be upgraded to the current situation of the technology. Um, concerning ethics, very shortly, there are three levels of ethics in robot. The first one is the ethics of human beings. That's the, that's the main ethics. We are ethical um, agent, you know, first of all. Our robots will be ethical agent only because us, because of we. So, robo ethics is the ethics of people who produce, design, produce and use robots. That it's us. Robot ethics is the ethics in robots that it's dependability, privacy, and all the, uh, the you know, um, laws that the robot should uh, obey, but it's because us, we are, you know, putting it. Then the third is most science fiction, that it's robots' ethics. And someone thinks that robots will be ethical per se, which in my view is really <laughs> a nonsense. <laughs> Regarding the education, I believe that uh, robotics should be used for education. I don't think we should uh, steer the, uh, the curriculum for robotics. I, in what uh, David mentioned earlier, I believe that it is better uh, in the early phases of the education to be general and broad, and so that we will have a, a degree of flexibility and try to control our urge to focus on an area that we can get quickly on the market uh, on the marketplace and earn some money. This is a de delicate balance to, to, to keep. And otherwise, we have to do what uh, David suggested earlier. If we uh, have narrow, let's say, uh, area of expertise, but we're pretty good at it. And this one, throughout our career, is getting lost, then we will definitely have to uh, find another way, like we want to retrain ourselves and do something else. So uh, I am in favor of using robotics to better train on the basics students as opposed to having as topics tool. very specific early. Uh, on the issue of ethics, uh, I completely agree more or less with, with um, Fiorella in the levels of uh, robotics. And again, that's why I said in the third level, it's very difficult for me to imagine what, what can happen. So <laughs> This is very interesting, actually, because, Alan, you could maybe address this. Is a, uh, there was a sense in the discussion that we had before this all started, this event started, and, and people were talking about um, robots that could, um, you know, that were so intelligent that they could begin thinking in a way that hadn't been programmed, right, essentially. So, uh, uh, and that is quite difficult to visualise. Are you, uh, can you, can this you imagine what the ethics would be involved in that? And I want to ask specifically Alan on, Alan on that because of his work on this. Um, it's a very good question. I, I mean, I, I kind of disagree really with, uh, you know, respectfully with Fiora and, and Nikos in the sense that when we have autonomous cars, which is likely to be reasonably soon, then we have, um, uh, we have vehicles, we have objects that, that could cause harm. Um, and, and really the designers of those vehicles have to consider, you know, the, as it were, the, the, the behaviours uh, under certain circumstances. I think you mentioned um, Andrea. So this is running over the old lady versus yes, running over I mean, the little child. You know, philosophers call it the trolley problem. It's yes. the problem of an ethical dilemma. Um, and... Uh, you know, it, it's extraordinarily difficult, and I, you know, I, I, having done a little bit of work in the last couple of years in, in the lab on making ethical robots, um, and in fact, actually presenting those robots with ethical dilemmas, the, the one thing that we need to understand is that <coughs> robots cannot be more ethical than humans. So, you know, th there's, there's no sense in which a robot can be kind of super ethical. So, the point is that we can 
Um, we can, in fact, we know, we, you know, we've demonstrated in principle that we can program robots to behave ethically. But, but those ethics have to be determined, predetermined by us humans. And that's why you know, I say very strongly that any work on ethical robots has to be a collaboration with, with ethicists uh, and lawyers. Uh, it's no good me as, a, uh, as an engineer deciding what ethics um, you know, my robot should have. Can, can I ask you something about, um, I remember writing a column on this actually which drew quite a big reaction which was this idea because robots can't, don't, they don't have emotions as it were and sometimes human beings can be in difficult situations for example on a battlefield where their actions may be clouded by emotion and so if you put a robot in that situation they don't have this I suppose the messy, the messiness involved and can may actually be able to make a clearer ethical decision. Is that anything that you would uh, consider? Is that a... Um, it, it has been demonstrated that uh, in a battlefield, emotions can be uh, important to select the decision. So, I mean, it's, it's in a sense sometimes uh, wrong to, to, um, to conceive emotions as a way of being irrational. Emotionally is something, rational is something, irrationality is not emotion. So human being is emotionally driven and this is his, her, her nature, nature. There is a, um, a scientist in the United States who said that, uh, Arthur, who said that uh, being um, robots unemotionally they will be uh, uncruel and they will be good on the battlefield. So s look at what drones are doing in Pakistan. Now I want to open up the, um, open up the discussion now to the, I would like to take the question here from Uber and one here and we've got one there. So have we got the roving mic please? And could you please say who you are if it's relevant and if you want a particular well, panel uh, member to answer. Coming back to the battlefield, uh, maybe the road is a battlefield also, <laughs> in a certain sense. Uh, the question in, in Germany, it's a practical question of an autonomous car, uh, when it comes into an accident with, uh, uh, with humans, then you, the, the question is, how does the autonomous car decide? One option is to crash into a car with a single person, and the other one is to crash into a car with five persons. Uh, what is the, uh, how do you uh, decide now? What is more ethical, to crash into one person or to five, and kill five or one? Um, another comment is on education, <coughs> talking about STEM, the subjects. Um, I feel there is still a lot of, uh, lot of um, uh, educational material and pedagogy has to be done to develop the bridge between robotics and actual improvement in STEM subjects. Uh, I, re I, I remember statistics about using the PC, the computer, in schools. And it was a horrible statistic. It was all over Europe. Uh, very few teachers were able to use a PC and the, nobody really wanted to use a PC because the kids were much better uh, than the teacher. So uh, we need to develop uh, pedagogy. We need to develop <coughs> material probably and to see how, besides uh, the pure um, transition or transmission of facts, of actual knowledge, uh, we need to know how the enthusiasm with robots can be used for learning. I think that is the major uh, key message for uh, education with robots. It's an, an enthusiasm which needs to, which helps a lot. It's, a, it's so, when you see uh, uh, kids working, uh, with robots, you see the enthusiasm, and this needs to be uh, amplified. It needs to be used. It's the same. It's and, and again, not only for kids. I've been in a. Uh, I've seen a project for women coming back from maternity leave, into and trying to uh, catch up with uh, technology. And they were given a two-week uh, class uh, course on robotics, and this was the first time in their life when 45, 50-year-old women building a robot kit and they this was they would they, they developed such a self-esteem 
from, from this, that it was such a, a driving component of, of uh, self-esteem, motivation, and so on. Thank you. I, I'm going to take um, a, the next question. Yes. And so that then perhaps the panel can take, take you both together. Uh, Steve Battle from UWE. Um, Nikos brought up Isaac Asimov and the wonderful three or four laws of robotics, so I can't help having a go at that. Um, so um, the, the point of his stories were that when you try to capture the three or four laws, in, 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 you know, when you try to encode them, it all goes horribly wrong in the end. All of his stories kind of go turn the handle and it all goes wrong. Um, so it's all about the futility of trying to do that. So I've been so laws are always open to interpretation. So I'm interested in how Alan, you think you can capture that, and also from the legal perspective uh, about how laws are interpreted. And, and could, in your answer, somebody articulate what those laws are? These are Isaac Asimov's laws, I presume. <laughs> the first one is uh, do no harm to human. The second one is obey humans and without violating the first one. And the third one is defend, you know, protect yourself without violating, violating the previous two. But again, you're right. Uh, there are many examples in his books that, you know, there is a debate on their, and there are positions where it's a deadlock, you know. You cannot find ways out of it. And uh, again, we can, love, I think we, you ask for others to give an answer. Yeah. So was your, sorry, was your, so was your question that are the laws valid or? Do they work or are they outdated? Well, the stories are that, you know, it's, it's a few exercise. When you try, when you try to, do, to do that, it all goes wrong. So, you know. to what extent does it work? So do so, the laws work? So, uh, um, when, I do, when I say I do robo law, I always specify I do not do Asimov kinds of laws. <laughs> uh, I, I, I like to analyze very specific, concrete problems and provide solutions to those. But um, I have to say that um, why I say that is also because uh, that was a very interesting and very uh, uh, fascinating intellectual exercise, but based on the assumption that there are such things as robots that can actually think, that uh, are capable of self-representing themselves and making decisions based on some kind of process, thanks to the positronic brain that is somewhat replicating the human brain. But machines are not operating that way. And if we program them to take a decision, even if it's an ethical decision, it's still you know, executing a program or executing a function that was predetermined in the machine. So um, uh, that is a, uh, it's a, a very complex technical issue, but it's a very different issue from that that Asimov himself, I think, was considering the moment he was making his short stories. And I think it goes back to this idea that um, Fiorella articulated yeah, that hum, robo, ro robot ethics are human ethics. Just, you know, concerning the paradox uh, uh, Dr. Haas raised about the car um, having to decide, decide killing one or the other uh, victims, again, I think that human beings is uh, sometimes or many times like medical doctors in front of such a dilemma, like uh, saving the, 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 the mother or the child. So I think that we humans have to teach the robots all these laws and to put all these laws that it's robot ethics in the robots. Um, thinking that, it will, I mean, the problem is that it's not one robot. We will have a cloud of robots. We will have objects, robotics with intelligence. I mean, we cannot think only these robots alone, this is a, you know, uh, a wrong picture. We will have a cloud of, of robots built, um, controlled by consoled, etc. So uh, all this will be quite complicated in the future. Like think to telecommunication networks, IOTs, M2M, etc. Simply multiplicated per hundred. In terms of ethics, I would like to point out that there are different cultures that have different ethics. So it is difficult to say one, one thing is good and the other thing is bad. Because depending on the culture and the way that we have been brought up, things might be different. Uh, one point is that. And regarding going back to a little bit on the, on the battlefield, uh, just when you say robots will do that objectively, etc., 
it's, it has been proven that the main reason that soldiers fight is because of the guy next to them. So if the robot cannot have the same type of attachment to my bodies or my uh, soldiers, you know, the, that, that I'm spending, uh, I'm, I'm digging the hole with the, the foxhole with them, then it's difficult to see how we can, they can emulate the same type of behavior. So this is a small interaction. I'd like to address um, Uwe's point um, about you know, the, the car having to make this, this terrible choice. Firstly, of course, it's very, very unlikely that, that we will have driverless cars that even will have the, the sensory uh, or you know, AI, sensory capability or, or AI to determine uh, that there is a choice. But, but, but we have to face the fact that there will sooner or later be a fatal accident. It's inevitable, isn't it? Uh, we all, I'm sure we all agree that. Now, you know, that first fatal accident caused by a driverless car, um, what, what's really important is what happens after that accident. And I'm, I've been advocating, uh, and I know others do, that, that there should be something like a, a robotics commission. Uh, in other words, a trusted public body that would, uh, that would for instance, investigate that accident rather like we in the, the way that we currently have air accident investigators, uh, international bodies who are trusted uh, and who are transparent. And I think it's only if we have such a body, quite possibly supported by data from a kind of black box, uh, in other words, I, I'd also advocate that autonomous cars need the equivalent of a flight data recorder to provide exactly the data that the, that the, the commission would need. And only through having that kind of trusted and transparent process will we get over the, the trauma, if you like, of that first fatal accident uh, so that ultimately uh, driverless cars will be trusted. Thank you. And there were two other um, questions from the, which I'm going to take. There's a chap here, and then I'll take the lady on the aisle, and then there's one final one at the back. Can I take, can you just keep your questions brief? I'll take all of them first, and then we'll go to the panel. It's Andy Graham from OC Robotics. Uh, the panel seems to be in broad agreement that robot ethics, uh, such as it is today, is a, is a function or output of the design or the manufacture of the robot rather than an inherent property that's developed by the robot itself. Um, speaking for myself, I think uh, the current technologies are unlikely to develop to the stage where that changes, but does anyone on the panel uh, think a technology will emerge that's capable of evolving an independent intelligence which is capable of supporting independent ethics? And if so, where will you hide? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take the lady's question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beth Cottrell. Um, I completely agree ethics isn't right or wrong answers. It's due to what each individual thinks is right or wrong. And so should you necessarily be getting into a car that its ethics has been decided by someone else? Or should you be able to decide the ethics of your car? Um, sorry, no. <laughs> um, because, for example, you might be putting your, uh, a price on your life far higher than that of two anonymous strangers because of what you know is your important responsibilities. So your car has the option of crashing into two people or crashing you into a wall. And how do you think that will affect trust in the cars? So I love, I love that. Driver ethics versus Google ethics, maybe. So, and then we had one questioner at the back, and I'm going to take that question now, please. <coughs> Hello, my name's uh, Chris Holder. I'm a technology lawyer and have been for a very long time. And there are lots of laws around, um, especially in the UK, which, which deal with ethics, which deal with product liability, so machines can't harm, which deal with talks of negligence, so people and machines, um, who, uh, people who produce machines should have that duty of care to others. So I'm just interested to know which areas of ethics you think laws need to develop in. That first question, which I suppose could be described as autonomous ethics, um, or evolve, you know, self-evolved ethics, is that on the horizon? Is, is it on the horizon? Um, I, th I think there's a deeper question, which is, if somebody were to one day develop a machine or, or, or a technique or a technology that did that, would we actually replicate it? Um, we, we would have to think really carefully in just the same way that we maybe had to think very carefully about whether we built nuclear weapons or not, uh, I think we would have to think very carefully as a society about whether that should be replicated, even if, if it ever happened. 
who, who would t make the final decision, do you think, given that it's probably in the hands of corporations? Um, well, no, it wouldn't be in the hands of corporations. I think it would be in the hands of governments and it would, be, it would become an issue for, for public uh, to, to make the decision. And, and I think, I mean, Alan would probably have a better view of that than I do, but I don't see that being in the hands of corporations at all. Sorry, I meant the knowledge w would be in there, well, the, the, I would imagine. Yes, the knowledge may well be, but um, I, I think you wouldn't keep that private for very long. I think it would, it would come out pretty rapidly. I perfectly agree on that. I, I think that there are uh, canting grounds, utilitarian grounds to exclude that, that is even possible on top of technological grounds and in the end it would be a, a, a political decision to commit suicide because if you, if you, could, if you could create a machine that is uh, uh, more intelligent than a human being and that has its own ethics, why should it want to be somewhat controlled or respecting our uh, lesser form of life? So I mean that's just, you know, uh, but I think this is such a remote possibility that we should just take that off the table and, and start discussing serious matters. Okay, Let's, if, unless anyone wanted to come back desperately, Alan, you do. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to, to just disagree a little bit in the sense that, um, you know, I, I feel very strongly that, that robots don't have to be sentient in order to be ethical. In other words, I think rather unintelligent robots like driverless cars uh, still may well need to have some low-level behavior pre-programmed and you know, decided, if you like, by, by us, by society, and ultimately legislated by government, which in fact does represent uh, some harm reduction, some consequentialist ethics. So, so uh, you know, a, a driverless car could still be an, a, an ethical zombie. Oh. Okay, um, I'm, I want to move on to the driver ethics. So basically your driverless car has the ethics of the designers built in and they may not be the same as the drivers. So ha can we, can we customise them, should we? Where, where is, where's the issue of trust here? In most cases, the driverless cars that we're talking about right now, there's still a debate whether or not they will be in segregated spaces or not. So uh, if we're talking about driverless cars that they will, will operate in areas for driverless cars only, then it's a completely different problem than having driverless cars driving around uh, with people, first of all. So it's easier to manage and put some priority there because you know, with the way that we have right now, we can definitely bound the, their behavior. So, so you could take pedestrians out of the equation, for yes. example, can, but you still have the drivers, the non-functioning drivers of the other driverless cars. Yeah, but again, it's easier to, uh, if you have predictable behavior because you know you, what you, the logic that you have embedded in them, it's a much easier problem. And you also controlling the environment in which they operate. It's a different problem than having them in the freeway where I might be, you know, li listening, trying to send an SMS and I'm veering away uh, of it in, uh, you know, five meters from it or right next to it, etc. So it's uh, a different problem. This is what I'm trying to point out. Yeah. But, but this is precisely, I mean, the, the, uh, the wrong conception with robotics because if we think that robots um, will be. Um, used in a society like now, it will be impossible, you know. The society to be able to use robots has to make a jump. You know, you cannot think a driverless car just in our street. I mean, it's totally crazy, you know. Um, but you, you have to think to change our path and our mobility to allow for driverless car to be. So, I mean, we change, that's precisely, I mean, we are, we are, we are still, living in the old worlds where robots are, I mean, just an example. In the, in the movie iRobot, the movie iRobot starts with an, a nonsense that it's um, a, a garbage car, you know, stops. Then three robots, humanoid robots, costing, I mean, you can imagine how, just jumping from this robotics garbage car lifting the, uh, the, the garbage uh, booth and putting all the garbage in. I mean, this is the wrong conception of robotics in society. 
I just want to change, change the debate a little bit. We're talking about cars, we're talking about something we understand, we're talking about something with very concrete rules already in our own society. Uh, actually, the real ethical issues are going to come in things like elderly care, um, and where things are, are much greyer as to what is right and what is wrong. Um, so a very simple example of how, as Alan is saying, a non-sentient machine will need to be ethical. Uh, if you have a robot in somebody's home, maybe helping them, just very gently looking after them, keeping an eye on them, that robot will learn an enormous amount about that person. A lot of private detail about when they take their medication, about which medication they take, about their mental state. That is valuable pieces, those are valuable pieces of information. If that robot is supplied by a commercial company, in theory they can have access to that data. That is an ethical problem and, and it, it, it is not going to go away. That, that, that is an excellent point, actually, because we always do the I mean, driverless cars are held up as the exactly. sort of society's, you know, contact. But as you say, the care bots are going to be a really big, a big issue. And we had the one question at the back from the lawyer um, about, as I understand it, whether whether we need a new law or whether we can it's cope not just with new laws. Yeah, it's, there are lots of laws around. So, so we, can we, we just adapt them? So I, I would like to pick up on this last example. I totally agree with, uh, with your analysis. Uh, this is a very good example, one of the, um, the robots for the care of the elderly. Um, it's a very interesting technology. And there, uh, the case, the, the, the hypothesis that we just considered is a case for privacy by design, for instance. So this is a case where uh, an early uh, uh, analysis and legal analysis undergone at the design phase um, allows allows uh, conceiving the robot in a way that the, the data, the information that is necessary for the functioning of the robot is also processed in a, uh, a reasonable way and, and, and kept uh, reasonably uh, safe. Of course, it will never be fully and absolutely and completely safe, but nothing is in this world. So this is a, a, a good example where ethics and law uh, come to an intersection and also come to an intersection with engineering and design. So it's, it's all these things are uh, uh, tightly intertwined with one another. I think um, that that's a very good point at which to end, unless any of the panellists want to make any other comments on, on what we've heard. I think that's been a really terrific discussion, actually, and it's definitely illustrated the points of public interest, I think, and social engagement and where people's worries are, because unless we know where they are, then it's very hard for um, society to sort of get engaged in the very positive way that I think that people would like in the robotics industry. So I'd like to show our appreciation to the panel, please. Thank you.